welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the Anna Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities uh, at the Bard College. Uh, my name is Nicholas Dunn. I'm a fellow here uh, in the center. I teach um, philosophy and political theory uh, and the Bard Prison Initiative. Um, prior to this, uh, many of us were just uh, visiting the Hannah Arendt archive in the, uh, in the library, which is a collection of uh, about 4,000 volumes, uh, ephemera and pamphlets of, from Arendt's personal library, uh, many of which include Arendt's marginalia, uh, underlinings, uh, handwritten notes, uh, and on display were some of Arendt's copies of Kant, his first critique uh, in English and German, uh, third critique in English and German, some of other, uh, other sources um, of Arendt's, uh, Karl Jaspers, um, which she credit, who she credits as helping her arrive at her uh, now, I think, famous and creative reading of Kant's third critique. Um, Arendt's lectures on Kant's political philosophy uh, were delivered in the fall of 1970 at the New School for Social Research in New York City, um, which brings me to our uh, distinguished guest, uh, Ronald Beener. Uh, in 1982, uh, Professor Wiener uh, edited and compiled these, which you're probably all familiar with, uh, um, Arendt's lectures on Kant's political philosophy. Uh, the posthumous publication of these lectures, Arendt died in 1975, uh, has given rise to a significant body of literature uh, in philosophy, political theory, uh, and beyond, uh, and continues to have an enduring impact on uh, Arendt's studies. Uh, the lectures have been translated into, I believe, 16 uh, languages, uh, and they're the subject of a forthcoming volume uh, from De Gruyter that I'm editing, uh, and to which Professor Beener and several other uh, others in attendance here are contributing. Uh, Ronald Beener is Professor Emeritus uh, in Political Science at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, he's the author of seven books, including uh, Political Judgment, 1983, uh, What's the Matter with Liberalism, 1992, uh, Civil Religion, A Dialogue in the History of Political Philosophy, 2011, Political Philosophy, What Is It and Why It Matters, 2014, uh, and most recently, Dangerous Minds, Nietzsche, Heidegger, uh, and the Return of the Far Right, 2015. Uh, he's written numerous articles in the history of political thought, contemporary political philosophy, philosophy covering a range of thinkers, a uh, range of topics, liberalism and communitarianism, religion and secularism, nationalism and citizenship, uh, history, truth, and of course, judgment. Uh, and he's edited several volumes, including of relevance, uh, <coughs> Judgment, Imagination, and Politics, themes from Kant and Arendt, which he co-edited with Jennifer Nadelsky uh, in 2001. Uh, he received his PhD from Oxford, uh, and his undergraduate from McGill University in Montreal, where coincidentally I did my PhD. And in fact, it was at McGill uh, where I first encountered Arndt's Kant lectures as a first year graduate student. Uh, I was in um, political theory research group and distinctly recall sitting there in the common room. We had this uh, really fantastic political theory library with uh, texts from Aristotle and uh, <coughs> Montesquieu and Charles Taylor, uh, and I saw this book, I was working on Kant, I saw this book with the word Kant uh, on the spine, and I pulled it, I think it was actually this copy that I have here, uh, and I took it off, uh, so I took it off the shelf and um, started reading, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, I can say a lot about the influence uh, that this text has had uh, on me and my research, um, uh, I wouldn't have started to work on um, the dissertation as a PhD student that I ended up writing um, had I not encountered these lectures. And I certainly wouldn't be here today at Bard and the Hannah Arendt Center and working on the things I'm working on now uh, if I hadn't picked up this book. Uh, and so on that note, it's a real treat for me to be able to have you uh, here with us today to talk about Arendt's lectures on Kant. And so I wanted to invite everyone to join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ronald Wiener. Uh, so, before diving into the, the history and the background um, of the lectures, uh, which I and I think a lot of us are, are curious to know more about, um, maybe we could just start even with a kind of brief overview of uh, the Kant lectures for those who are maybe less familiar. Uh, as I noted, these are lectures that Arndt gave in the fall of 1970. 
uh, at the new school. Um, in a few words, uh, what are they about? What are some of the key topics uh, or themes or even maybe claims that she makes? Uh, in the oh, uh, well, as I imagine most people know, this was intended. Well, first let me say a few words and thanks to you, Nick. Uh, so obviously, I'm super grateful to Nick for bringing us to Bard. It's a real thrill. I've wanted to come here for a long time and I'm super excited to be here. And so I saw Aaron's library just before we walked over here and I'm soon to see Aaron's place. <coughs> so all that's very exciting and I'm also super grateful to Nick for putting together the the, the volume that uh, prompted this, uh, this two-day workshop. So thanks so much for all that. That's terrific. And uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, I imagine most people uh, know that Aaron's last project was something she called the life of the mind, uh, that uh, it was written, <coughs> we presented as uh, lectures at the University of Aberdeen uh, as Gifford lectures, which very, very famous and prestigious lecture series. And in fact, there's a big uh, conference at the end of the summer at the University of Aberdeen on Aaron to mark the anniversary of her delivery of those Gifford lectures. And so the lectures were divided into three parts, thinking, willing, and, uh, and judging. And the, the basic idea is that her most uh, important work of philosophy, she didn't want, maybe didn't want to think of it as philosophy, but it actually was, it was the human condition, which was an account of uh, human worldliness and the, the activities that, that constitute our worldliness. Uh, but her feeling was that it kind of, uh, uh, that uh, it, it left out the uh, important dimension of human life, which is our mind and how we exercise our mind and different capacities of the mind. And the most, the three major capacities that she took them to be were to think, to will, and to judge, and the thinking and willing were, she lectured on that uh, at Aberdeen, and the idea is then she would write uh, an account of judging, but she, alas, died the day that she put the first page of uh, the judging section of Life of Mine in her typewriter, and all that was left, uh, it's in reproduced in the frontispiece of the book, is the, the, the title Judging and Two Epigraphs, and then she was sent to King's and Friends and had a massive heart attack, as indeed she had a massive heart attack in, in Aberdeen in the midst of uh, giving the Gifford lectures. And the second major heart attack killed her pretty much on the spot. And <clears throat> so she never, she didn't, clearly, she didn't live to finish that work, The Life of the Mind. And so there are a few uh, excerpts from uh, these lectures on Kant that she gave both at Chicago and later at the New School. Uh, in uh, Volume 2 of The Life of the Mind, I was able to get a hold of those, and I can tell the whole story later, but basically the, the Kant lectures are c closest will ever come to what Aaron intended the <coughs> judging section of Life of the Mind to be, and drawing heavily on leading themes in Kant's uh, third critique, critique of judgment, taste, sense as communis, communicability, you know, th that she just pulls these things out of the third critique and tries to turn them or reconstruct them into a political philosophy. And, and uh, it's generated kind of tremendous uh, interest and had, uh, uh, you know, very substantial repercussions in the world of political theory, which is my world. And, uh, and uh, happily I was able to, to, to publish what we otherwise would lack, which is the concluding section of the life of the mind. So I titled this The Origin and Influence of the Comp Lectures, and I wanted to start, I guess, by asking you about the first part, the origin. Um, and I think this is a question I asked you the first time we, we spoke, um, which is something I was very curious about, which is um, how exactly did these come to be? And by this I mean, how exactly did you find yourself in a position where you ended up getting these uh, lectures published in this, in this book? 
for Yeah. Them. Well, I'm happy to tell the story. It's not that short a story, so I hope people uh, uh, are patient. Uh, so I went to Oxford in the fall of 1975. I was 22 years old. I actually went there to do PPE, but by the end of the first term, I decided to switch to a doctorate, and Oxford being the unique and strange institution that it is, took only one phone call to transfer me from a BA to a DPhil, and so I started at the end of that term thinking about what I would write a doctoral thesis on, and initially I thought I'd do something on the philosophy of language. Uh, and then I read two essays that had a huge impact upon me. One was Aaron's The Crisis in Culture, which many of you know, I'm sure, from Between Past and Future. And the other was Stanley Cavell's essay, Aesthetic Problems of Modern Philosophy. And they're both really kind of addressed to the same problem. What is it, what is it to judge? Uh, and both relating to aesthetics, but, but, but having implications far beyond aesthetics. And for me, it's like kind of connecting two wires and just sort of con it, it constitute a, a kind of electrical, uh, you know, uh, set off uh, electrical s s system or something. It, 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 uh, and I thought, well, this, this is really interesting, and this could, this could be a very interesting project. And so I decided to do a doctoral thesis on uh, errant and judging. And uh, I became aware of the Kant lectures because, you know, the life of the mind can pretty weirdly it was serialized in the New Yorker, and I was getting those, and, and it was clear that there was a kind of missing section. And so and I was aware of the, you know, when, when the life of the mind was published, it did have these short excerpts. Uh, and so I thought, well, I complete my research, I need the actual can lectures, I can, you know, the excerpts aren't enough, I need the full text. And so I wrote to Mary McCarthy, who was Harris literary executor, and I didn't get anything back. So I started writing to all of Aaron's uh, other, you know, famous friends, so I wrote to Hans Morgenthau, I wrote to J. Glenn Gray, and they all said the same thing, you know, you get these lectures from Mary McCarthy or you don't get them at all. <laughs> so I wrote back to Mary McCarthy and I said, well, I wrote, wrote to you previously, but I guess my letter got lost in the mail. And I really need, I really need uh, these bad lectures to complete my doctoral research. Well, with the second attempt, she did write back to me and uh, said, well, just get a letter from your doctoral supervisor, say you need this, and I'll send them to you. And that's what happened, and she sent, so I had a copy. And then I got to meet her. There was a, a memorial event uh, for Arendt's uh, at, uh, uh, at, uh, in, at the cultural, U.S. Cultural Attaché in, in Paris. She was on a panel, I think Paul Ricoeur was on the panel, and uh, Richard Bernstein, who I was quite friendly with, um, was uh, there, and uh, he said, oh, let me introduce you to Merrick. So I, uh, you know, I got to meet her, and she said, oh, here's my phone number, call me up tomorrow, and we can, we can have a chat. So I, I did, I gathered up my courage, called her up, she invited me around, we got served, you know, tea and cookies by her maid on a like, silver tray in this <laughs> amazing pat, flat in Paris, and had a terrific discussion about the Kant lectures that went on for several hours, and she put lots of tough questions to me, and I was, you know, I was very young, I was in my uh, mid-twenties then, and at a, a later stage, and, you know, we sort of got on, and it was an amazing experience, <coughs> was super memorable, and uh, uh, a couple of friends, of I was teaching, then I went, moved to the University of Southampton, which was my first academic job, I was teaching there, and couple friends, political theory friends of mine, and I came up with the idea of having an annual lecture series called the Hannah Arendt Memorial Lecture. Uh, I think it might have been my idea, but it was somebody's idea, and it was a great idea. We had a lot of famous people over the years give annual lectures. Uh, McCarthy didn't give the first. She, she gave the first was George Steiner. And, uh, but I, we wrote to her and invited her to come, and she, she agreed to come and give the second hand Aaron Memorial Lecture in Southampton. Aaron actually had a tangential connection to, Aaron, uh, to Southampton because her mother, I believe, died uh, 
halfway across the Atlantic and crossing the Queenie between New York and Southampton, and Erin had to fly to Southampton to collect her dead mother. Uh, you know, it died mid mid Atlantic, so that was her connection to Southampton. Sort of a bit tenuous, but anyway, we had we decided to call this. Nobody, you know, we were able to do this, and this is and Mary McCarthy agreed to come give the second lecture, and she brought her uh, her her husband James West, who was an amazing person, and they decided to come for a few days, and my friends and I drove her around. We're, we were the hosts. We drove her around the uh, Hampshire countryside, and you know we got quite friendly. I mean, it's an amazing experience. <laughs> Famous person, and I was like in my twenties, and 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 you know we we really got on. And uh, at some point, I said to her, you know, we were having lunches in pubs and having dinner together, and you know we really got to be friends. And uh, at some point, I said to her. You know, I really think the Kant lectures should be published. You know, as a whole, not just uh, these excerpts. And and uh, Bernstein had warned me that well, Aaron, uh, McCarthy was very skeptical that this could be a book. Uh, he, he he she thought that they weren't polished enough. They didn't wouldn't reflect well on Aaron's reputation. That Jovanovich, uh, Aaron's main publisher, he had the same view. And, you know, she's not likely to go for this. So I was, you know, forewarned that I had to tread carefully. Uh, so she didn't respond, really. She just listened to me. And then she went back to Paris, where, where she was living. And then I waited a few weeks. I wrote to her and said, you know, I've been thinking about some more. And I think this really would be a major contribution to the world of Aaron's scholarship. And there's some important ideas here. And it really is... Um, important to, for this to be a book. And she kind of wrote back to me and said, well, I'll get you a publisher, just like that. I mean, <laughs> I did, I, unbelievable. She, and so she spoke to Japanovich. She is, Bernstein expected, was not interested. And so she, McCarthy was friends uh, with the director of the University of Chicago Press, Morris Philipson, who was a famous, you know, director. And so, Immediately, like the next day, I got a telegram from Morris Phillips and, uh, saying, you know, we'll take it. And uh, here, the contract's in the mail. Just like that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, didn't deal with any, uh, uh, I didn't do anything. And she did it all for me. And all it took was, you know, a kind of little chat and, and, and a follow-up letter. And suddenly I had this book contract. <laughs> You know, just drop in my lap like that. It's unbelievable. And you know, normally you, you want to get a book published, you got to deal with that acquisition editors. You don't go right to the top to the <laughs> famous director of the press. But so that's what happened. And I was like, you know, the book was published when I was 29. So this was, um, I guess, uh, 1980 or so. So I was. You know, I was 27 years old, and this is something, this is not a normal thing that happens to an academic, right? And, uh, but, you know, I really, I wasn't just, it wasn't just a song pitch. I mean, I really believed this in my heart, that the, this was really packed with fascinating ideas, and, you know, this, people would be interested in this, and, and, uh, and it would make a difference to our perception, and boy, was I ever, uh, Vindicated beyond my wildest dreams. I mean, I could never imagine it's going to be, you know, published in 16 or 17 or 18 languages and really generate a whole new generation of American scholarship, which undoubtedly it has. I mean, there's, I don't think anyone could possibly question that, that it really injected a whole new life into Arab reception in a way that, you know, and somehow I, um, you know, I anticipated that, and I sold it to McCarthy, and she felt well disposed towards me because we had had lunches and pubs in uh, Hampshire countryside, and uh, it's kind of amazing. You know, even me, I can't believe you know that this all happened. But, I mean, whether it was just good luck. I mean, partly it was because if I'm not sure she would have said yes to this if I hadn't actually gone to know her, and she felt trust in me because we had, you know. As, you know, I was just this young kid, but still she somehow saw, saw something in me that she felt she could trust my judgment, and 
she did, and she got me a contract, and you know, the rest <coughs> is history. So like that's that's pretty much. Yeah. Just wooing and courting. So you were sure, courting I and did, I did. I persuaded her, and I and she was initially resistant, and I'm thankful to Dick Bernstein for letting me know that I had to, you know, uh, uh, pursue this carefully, and so one let thing, it all work. Yeah. And, uh, so the, it was a sort of struggle to get the manuscript in the first place because, you know, other people may have. They didn't get a letter back, that might be the end of it. But I persisted and I got the text. And then having the text, had the opportunity to get to know her and for her to get to know me. And she got me a book contract in a way that's almost unheard of. So I'll that's just about the title uh, as well, because I think that was one, you know, um, there was a little bit of sort of pushback or um, controversy about what to call it. I mean, I think Arendt, if I recall, the, le the, the title, Lectures on Consequent Philosophy, was what she called. That, that course, because yeah. I think she was teaching at the same time, like a concurrent seminar on Kant's critique of judgment, by, which I think the imagination lecture right. was from. Yeah. Right. Um, but obviously, as you mentioned, um, you know, the topic of judgment is central to the Kant lectures, um, and you know, the, the part on judging, of course, didn't get written uh, in the life of the mind. Um, and if I recall, you wanted to call this. Yeah, I want to call it judging. Yeah. yeah. And uh, McCarthy would not budge on that. Uh, um, she, she said, well, we don't know what Eric would have written. And authors typically, they have various ideas, and then when they sit down to uh, type them up, it becomes something else. So how can we be assured that, you know, what were, it was in effect a draft of the book would have become the book. It would might become something else. Uh, I th my counter argument to that, which obviously did, did, here I did persuade her, uh, was that there is a kind of s sketch in in, in in the postscriptum to thinking, which is was published as part of the life of mine, where you know she basically indicates where she wants to go with respect to themes of uh, you know. His, the different ideas of history and different ideas of human dignity and what does or doesn't uh, redeem human dignity. And that's where the Kent lectures conclude. And I said, well, there's a kind of, there is a kind of matchup. And, and, and so she, it, it, you know, I tended to read the post, post, postscript to thinking as a kind of roadmap to what she was going to do in judging, which is why I included it in this, this version of the book. But you know, McCarthy did not uh, go for that. But you know, I, in, in as I mentioned yesterday, so some of the foreign translations they did call judging. So you know, the French translation is called jugé, and the German edition is called the Das Urteil, and the Dutch edition is called Erdelen. So you know, at least I, I won the battle with respect to some of those French language <laughs> translations. So I was very gratified by that. But I didn't win with the English. And uh, let me also say, having been uh, uh, friendly, having had, you know, the, the, the great fortune to become friendly with Mary McCarthy at a young age, uh, and, you know, I truly love Mary McCarthy, she's just an amazing person, uh, you know, it's a super big thrill to sit in a house that was once Mary McCarthy's residence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I visited her in her flat in, in Paris, so that was a big thrill, but it's a big thrill now to be in another Mary McCarthy residence, so. Want to express my appreciation for you know being able to sit in this living room. So I want to ask you a couple more questions, then we'll open it up for sure. for other staff questions. But just to sort of turn also to the, the reception part and the influence part of the Kant lectures. I mean, you mentioned um, uh, being sort of vindicated, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if maybe uh, wanted to elaborate at all sort of what you mean by 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 that. Yeah. Well. Uh, I mean, if you just, first of all, if you just look at the Arab literature, you can see that a big chunk of it is, revolves around the judging idea. And, you know, in political theory more broadly, which is, you know, that's my discipline, and Aaron clearly thought of herself as a political theorist, she tended to just avoid the, the notion of political philosophy, she preferred political theory. Well, I'm personally uncomfortable with either one, but it, you know, under the rubric of political theory, you know, it's had huge, huge uh, repercussions. I mean, Jenny Danowski and I tried to put together the literature that existed 20 years ago, and uh, you know, there's 
major theorists represented in, in, in that uh, judgment, imagination, and politics book. So even there, 20 years ago, and obviously there's been, uh, you know, major additions to literature since then. I mean, Linda Zerilli has published a couple of books on Arendt, and judging is not in that collection because her work on Arendt uh, is subsequent to that. So already in 2001, when we did that book, there was already a tremendous flowering of, you know, you look at all the big names who are in the book, Shayla Benneby and Iris Marion Young, and George, George Kateb, and, you know, it's like a, a pantheon of, of important uh, theorists. So there's no question it had a huge, and I think pretty clearly, uh, Arendt in general, but Kant lectures in particular had a pretty big impact on Habermas and then on Habermas's, uh, uh, the Habermasians, including Shayla, but, but other Habermasians, Velmers, and uh, the book I did with Jenny. So, you know, it, it's, I think to anybody in political theory, I mean, people who were my own grad students refer to it as the judgment literature. So it's, it did um, uh, generate a whole you know, sub sub field within political theory, and I think uh, any anybody who's a political theorist is very much aware of it. And not just the 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 people who work specifically on Arendt, on Arendt, but 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 more particularly those people would be aware of just how how you know and you know you're what you're trying to do in the volume is, is canvas other disciplines and the kind of spin offs and 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 the um, you know, in, in a whole range of disciplines, and I don't doubt that that's true, but I, you, you're probably more apprised of that than I am, and, but, you know, I certainly know within political theory that, that you know, it, it has made a huge difference. And, uh, you know, there are whole areas of research that wouldn't, wouldn't exist at all if, 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 uh, if the can lectures hadn't been published, and, you know, the fact that you're doing the volume, I think, speaks to that, sure. that you, you're, you're doing the volume because, it, you know, it's, it's apparent that there has been a very substantial reception, and it has changed, I think, pe people's reception of Arendt, full stop. I mean, beyond, I think, just sort of how much, you know, you mentioned sort of having a hunch or an intuition that this would be important, um, and then noting, you know, as you have, that it even kind of exceeded that. Beyond that, I'm wondering, like, is there something in particular that sort of surprised you the most about the influence that the lectures have had? Um, mm, that's, a, that's a tough question. I think I'll have to think more about that. I mean, I'll read your book after it's <laughs> published and then uh, let you know, you know, that, uh, that may kind of clue me into things that I'm not yet aware of and yeah. that, that may surprise me. Yeah, I mean, so my other question just before we sort of open it up is, I mean, I guess a cluster of questions related to kind of where we go from here and where you see the scholarship going, the discussions going, um, you know, if there are particular kind of further avenues for research or for reception of these lectures that maybe, you know, maybe there's aspects of the lectures that have not been attended to as much as other aspects that you think are sort of ripe for work to be done, just sort of where you kind of, you know, imagine things going from here. Well, let me say this: the, the 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 core question uh, being explored in the camp lectures is is so important that you know as thinking beings, it's something we need to clarify and explore and 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 pursue. So, what is it to judge? How uh, how how are we joined in a community with other people who are also trying to judge? And how do we deal with? disagreements of judgments, and what are the prospects of uh, reaching consensus in our judgments, and how does it constitute us as a, uh, a human community, and as a ethical community, as a normative community, as a civic community, that people are exerting themselves to judge well, and to judge rightly, and to get it right. Uh, these are fundamental questions. I mean, that's why I think it's I still regret that <laughs> it's called lectures on Kant's of philosophy. Makes it sound a little too academic and a little too constrained. And you know, my idea is that, that I mean, I guess why I got interested in this first, in, the, in, in all this in the first. These are big questions, and they get to the heart of what it is to be human. And Arendt was interested in pursuing this for that reason. 
And, uh, you know, it's a tragedy that, tragedy that she smoked so much and then we have to actually write the book. And so it fell to me, but, but uh, you know, I was sparked by this, and I see other people who've gotten interested in these lectures had the same experience of having a, like a, a spark ignited. Uh, th these are questions that, that are the heart of our humanity. And, and, uh, and uh, it's not, so in that sense, it's not an accident. <laughs> this, it made a major contribution to philosophical reflection on politics. So it should. And, and it's sort of, um, uh, you know, amazing that no one else tried to do something like this before. I mean, Kant didn't, actually. I mean, arguably, the, the philosopher who came closest this was Aristotle, for whom, you know, the, 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 the uh, re reflection on, on how, it, on, on what, what are the conditions for judging well is, is pretty central to his ethics. And it's, it's unfortunate that she didn't bring him into her dialogue. It was just a dialogue of her and Kant. It sh I think Aristotle should be part of that dialogue. And uh, actually, when I wrote the thesis, which I, half of which became my interpreter of essay in the Kant lectures, and half of which became a book of my own called Political Judgment, which I published in 1983. So the thesis that led into those two, two books um, was constructed um, uh, very much as a, a dialogue between Arendt and Goddard, because I think Goddard was sensitive to uh, Aristotle is also a potential source of for reflection on what it is to judge and how, how uh, forms of ethical community are constituted by our, our shared efforts to judge well and to judge rightly. And uh, so this was an important theme uh, in Godward. Actually, it was sort of a three-way dialogue. So if you look at the political judgment book, the, the opening chapter is Aaron, Aaron Godimer and Habermas on judgment. So it's a kind of three three-way three -way dialogue. So, you know, you could say that Gautamer's Truth and Method is sort of a, a tr also a treatise on judging. It's very different, but, you know, the nature of hermeneutics interact, intersects with many of the questions that uh, uh, Arendt is pursuing. So I, again, that sort of joined the two, sure. two wires in a way that she didn't. She never said a word about Gautamer. I mean, they were in seminar rooms together in the 1920s because they're both students of Heidegger, and I, they, his name pops up in letters between Heidegger and Aaron, but Heidegger's the one who mentions God, or where she never says a word about him. And uh, I, I once, I'm in 1984, I would say, we'll meet God and ask him about Aaron, and he seemed a little dismissive. He said, oh, she was right, she's not a philosopher. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, I don't think that did justice to Aaron, but, you know, he said, oh, I read the light to the mind. She says she's not a philosopher, and she was right. You know? <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, I, I think I showed, and I'd sent him a copy of my political judgment book, and he, he seemed to like it quite a lot. So I, you know, again, I sort of took it on myself to say, well, these are sort of, in a way, not quite parallel, but but certainly mutually relevant philosophies, and let me put them in dialogue, and that's what I did, and so that led to my political judgment book. Habermas is sort of part of that dialogue as well, and of course Habermas, in his case, he did directly address Aaron to judging, and you know I tended to side with him in in his criticisms of Aaron on these questions. But anyway, what really matters here is that somebody. <laughs> ought to put on the agenda the question of what is it for human beings to judge and what does it say about our humanity. So put like that, that's a very grand question. And, you know, it's because it's a grand question, I think she, she was a philosopher. Uh, she may have, you know, had all these disclaimers, I'm a political theorist, I'm not a philosopher, and philosophers don't consider me a philosopher. You know, you're a philosopher by virtue of the ambition of the questions you're asking. And if you're asking a question of that, meta, you know, that metaphysical, that grand, well, guess what? You are a philosopher, and <laughs> so uh, I would I would defend to the death, you know, her being a philosopher, even if I'm, you know, fighting that battle with Hannah Arendt herself. Well, so I want to um, open it up in the remaining few minutes. Uh, those of you uh, maybe have questions uh, for Professor Beener. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, it's fascinating to hear the story. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that. 
although where you were obviously the first one to recognize the value of these lectures, at the same time you're not uh, you, you're not completely a defender of the lectures. You you no, I'm you're quite critical. critical. Aspects, yeah. like, um, well, genuine dialogue has to be critical. I mean, there's, I mean, I, I assume she would say right. this herself. You can't just, you know. No, I, I agree with yeah. that. And you know, reading what you've written and based on what you said yesterday, that like you clearly have uh, points of disagreement. Very, yeah, very yeah, strong points of, of disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. My question is like, what was what role did these disagreements play in your first encounter with the manuscripts? Um, did you have any hesitation, or did, did you have any sort of, um, I mean, when you first read them, did you have any doubts based on the disagreements, or you immediately thought, despite this point where I don't agree, I can see that this has um, tremendous relevance for the field of political theory or for the humanities, but also connected to that, like, I mean, after all this time, as we all acknowledge the influence of these lectures, um, do you think this influence is generally or 100% positive, or are, are there any aspects where you think, well, maybe some people have read the lectures in a way that I, do, I don't think it has led in, in the right direction, or they have focused on aspects where I think, where, where I don't agree? You know, it's just generally true of philosophy that fruitful disagreements are fruitful. They're good for philosophy. It's good for people to disagree and pursue those disagreements robustly. And you would, one would be shocked if people just, you know, spontaneously agreed. But, you know, um, uh, and, and it enriches philosophy that disagreements are, are, are robust ones. Um, and um, so, you know, my experience over time, I guess, is that the people who have most influenced me, I've lived with the longest, you know, 40 years, I guess, or longer in some cases. The longer you're kind of communing with them, you're in their company, the more you see weaknesses. And so I can't say there's any thinker who's had a, you know, important influence on me, of whom I've not become very critical. I, in 2014, I published this book, Political Philosophy, What It Is and Why It Matters. And it's a dialogue with those thinkers who, with whom, including Aaron, with whom I've been in dialogue since I was a, you know, in my 20s, I started doing political theory. And I have big disagreements with all of them, and I try and articulate as clearly as I can what those disagreements are, but that doesn't diminish the influence, how they shaped me as a theorist, how they made it possible for me to be a theorist, that they given me things to think about that could only have arisen in dialogue with them, and so it should be. And philosophy is always a critical dialogue. I mean, I'd say in Aaron's case, yeah, on the whole, I've become more critical over time. Maybe there's certain things I should have been more critical of right from the start. But, you know, again, in a kind of lifelong dialogue, communing with them, once sees more and more clearly, I would say, the blind spots. But in the case of the Kant lectures, I think if all the criticisms I might have made of her yesterday, they're all in the interpretive essay. I did, did all that, I think, I, I, those, those um, uh, vulnerabilities, the, the intellectual vulnerabilities, I think I, I saw it as soon as I read them. And, and part of it is, well, I was reading other people. And so, you know, one has very different reading the critique of judgment and Gautamer's truth and method. So I was able to balance it off of that and say, well, there's that the, that that I can pick up things from Gautamer that allows me to see problems or weaknesses in Aaron's reading, uh, no, or what she was trying to draw from from Kant, uh, you know, the formalism of Kant's aesthetics. I mean, you know, Gautamer's very acute on that, and Aaron has finds ways of working around it, uh, or the problem of truth in the kind of Habermas Aaron dialogue. Well. You know, so I was reading Habermas, and, and I, it, I wasn't just reading Aaron, you know, I was reading other people, and, and trying to put them all in dialogue with each other, and of course, the one sees at certain points, you know, uh, uh, there are strengths in Aaron that aren't in other theorists, and there are strengths in other theorists that aren't in Aaron, and you try and draw them all into, so, in the political philosophy book I mentioned, so there's 12 thinkers, and I'm in dialogue with all 12, and I'm trying to put all 12 in dialogue with each other. And in some cases, they were in dialogue with each other, because some of the theorists I consider actually had debates, which were published, and you can read them and see how they argued out their 
you know, and in other cases, I took it upon myself to construct these dialogues because I was in dialogue with them, so I could put them in dialogue with each other. And that's what I've, I've tried to do that throughout my career, and I've done it certainly with Aaron, including with the Kant lectures. And so, my some of my challenges are, you know, thanks to other people I, I was reading who gave me other insights and 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 and, and helped me to identify where Aaron might have fallen short in some respects. But overall, still a tremendously powerful set of lectures. I mean, this is amazing. It's mind blowing that you know she could give this course to a bunch of students in new school and just generate so much in the space of. And it's very short. It's like what seventy or eighty pages. You know, thirteen lectures, and most lectures the manuscripts are very short. You know, and yet just fantastic generation of 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 ideas and insights and. You know, I, for the thing I gave yesterday, I just kind of compiled a list of themes and as I was rereading the lectures for this workshop, kind of draw it and I counted 58 important themes in, in those. Well, that's pretty amazing for, uh, you know, a very short lecture course. It's, you know, 80 or 90 pages in manuscript or something. Uh, so, and it still has tremendous power today and I think we'll continue to have uh, uh, important uh, legacy in theory. I certainly hope it does, and I don't see why it shouldn't, because the questions are so important. So my question is for Professor Beamer, but this is a question that uh, Nick might have some things to say about as well. Um, Nick mentioned that he teaches in the Bard Prison Initiative. Yeah. I think that is absolutely one of the best things right. that Bard College does. and. You know, given that unjust imprisonment was a part of Arant's uh, history before she came to the United States as a refugee, do you think she would uh, connect her views about an ideal civil society and republicanism and justice to what the Bard Prison Project is trying to do? Or, or do you think that her fraud um, engagements in other areas, such as reflection on Little Rock and the controversy that generated, would have limited her ability to um, see that, to see the value of the program and to see that, that the people that this program engages with have something to contribute to what, what she called census communis? Yeah. Well, I'll say a couple of things and I'll turn it over to Nick. I'm sure he has interesting things to say. Um, so first of all, just because you're committed to the enterprise of theorizing judgment, it doesn't mean that in all respects you have judgment or that your judgment is good judgment. There were, I think, lapses in Aaron's judgment. It doesn't necessarily retract from her as a theorist or as a philosopher. I think she was a tremendously powerful theorist. But, you know, I think there were ups and downs to her own judgment and a little off. I think it would be hard to defend her today. And some of the judgments she expressed about some of those, you know, uh, debates of, the, of, of, of uh, the contemporary debates of her own day. So, it, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, it's hard, hard to, uh, you know, anticipate what are what are concrete judgments would be with respect to particular social issues. Um, but at the theoretical plane, you know, I once had uh, once had lunch with Michael Walter, and we got to talk about Hannah Arendt. He was pretty critical of her. I mean, many theorists, important theorists, are critical of Arendt. And but his criticism was interesting. So he said, "Well, there's no." There's no 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 count of justice in her. So how can this be a you know a sufficient political philosophy? And you know he meant by, by justice he meant social justice. And pretty deliberately in on revolution she is you know uh, moving political philosophy somewhere else. And the questions of social justice were pretty clearly not at the, the center of her theoretical enterprise. Uh, she had other. Uh, strengths. I mean, I think the the center of her uh, her career as a theorist is civic agency, and you know, and and 
the importance of politics for the sake of politics, for the sake of being political and people uh, appreciating and rising to the vocation of being citizens in the full sense. That was, that's what makes her an important political philosopher. That's why people still read her. And other things that concern many theorists, you know, that wasn't central to her. And, you know, I think, uh, I don't think Walter's challenge was um, obviously unfair. I mean, there, I, I don't think that conservative justice can be absent from, I'm sure you can find texts in Eric where, where justice is something that concerns her, but the sense in which he was referring to it, social justice, I don't think, I don't think anyone could say this was central to Aaron. I think what was central to Aaron was civic agency. It's important that we reflect on what it is for us to be citizens and why civic agency is part of being human and an essential part of being human. We're less human without civic agency. So if we're living in a world that's sort of depoliticized, we're all the poorer for it. And she articulated that probably better than anyone else. And, be, you know, she had uh, the power to articulate it better than, than any other theorists. But there are a lot of things that sh just were, if they weren't totally off a radar screen, they certainly weren't central. And this is pro you know, probably one of them. So anyway, I'll let Nick uh, take over. Yeah, I mean, we all, I, I agree with what you just said. And I think uh, you know, it's hard. It's kind of like what the questions that motivated a lot of these uh, discussions of you know, what would Art have said on the sure. part. I think it's similar to one of these kind of sure. uh, questions. I mean, um, I would say, uh, well, I, I'll just say this, and for the sake of time, maybe just allow others to answer questions. I'm, um, I taught a little bit of Kant this past semester in the prison, and um, there was a lot of interest in Kant. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm planning my next course for the prison, and I'm thinking of actually doing Kant lectures. In the oh wow! So <laughs> it was amazing. Know. Yeah, give us a report. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fascinating to hear how the. How I, the I hope you're right about yeah, that. Yeah. I'd love to hear what the reception is. Yeah, that would be terrific. Because, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say quickly that as you were speaking, one of the things I was thinking about is that, you know, in, in her criticisms of fascism, she said, look at, you know, look at the horrible consequences that happen when a whole group of people is, is made superfluous. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I love that prison project is because of you know, all of the new work that's being done on prison abolition, and it, it, you know, it's a way of resistance and it's a way of saying, no, these people are not superfluous people. We won't stand mm -hmm. for an institution that says that these people are superfluous. Of course, they're right there, you know, that could be easily framed as a problem of social justice. Right. Uh, and, but, you know, I think her preferred vocabulary, her framework, privileged civic agency and civic status and what it is to be a citizen and how we can't be fully human unless your civic status is acknowledged. So her framework is about citizenship. But it, you know, there, the, the idea that, well, social justice is just not there, you know, I think that would be grossly overstating it. Obviously, much of what concerned her could be restated in the language of social justice, but she didn't because she had her own preferred uh, vocabulary and you know for every theorist there's a kind of center of gravity and everything uh, orbits around that center of gravity it's pretty clear I think what that center of gravity is and it's different from that of m many other theorists uh, working today and I mean she was a unique mind and she had she was had the capacity to zero in and things that no one could capture or zero in on with that kind of force and and, you know, you should appreciate a great thinker for their own specific contribution rather than say, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? One should appreciate her for what she uniquely has the, 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 the capacity to articulate. So we have time for one more question. We'll go to Nirvana. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, you're <laughs> written, yeah. yeah. So what do you think, in, since you brought the stocks into view, what do you think has been easiest to misunderstand in it? Hmm. Uh, do you have a view about that? <laughs> I want your view. Oh, you want my view? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think that I think the text is is pretty accessible. I don't. It's it's easy to read. It was written for students, 
and uh, and and you know even the life of the mind, in some ways more esoteric, is published in the New Yorker. So uh, and a lot of you know a lot of our works, you know, in a way very different from what you'd have expect of a leading intellectual. So she you know ha, ha, both was able to and wanted to write for general readers, and I think she did that very effectively. I think the same thing is true with the human condition. You don't need any special training or expertise to be able to read it. It's written for a book. It's a book written to fellow human beings who are thinking about important questions. Uh, I, uh, I mean, there's disagreement, so one would, one a particular question say, well, this person kind of is closer mark than someone else, but yeah, and I think they're all fruitful disagreements. Uh, I mean, I have so, some disagreements with other uh, readers of the Cat Lectures, I guess, but I don't know if I would just yeah. say, well, they misunderstood. Uh, <coughs> we disagree, and so well, why would you expect otherwise? You know, no, so what else is new? Disagreement is fine. I'm just yeah. talking about misunderstanding. Mm. Do you think there's something there? People could easily, more easily misunderstand about that book because of a dimension of the book itself. So it sounds like you haven't, you know, no, you I'm haven't just, answered the question. I'm just, well, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. No, I guess no. You think people, for the most part, it's not like. Um. I, you know, I guess certain parts of it maybe are a little more intellectually challenging than other parts, but on the whole, I think it's clear what she's saying, and. Uh, I don't see that there's anything there that's, you know, <laughs> intended to trip people up or likely to trip them up. Uh, I mean, we always get better readers and worse readers, but 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 I th I think that you know the text is pretty clear. Uh, you have, you have a view about that, Nick? Yeah, and I think the line between like claims that can be interpreted differently and over which there can be disagreement versus just like yeah, flat out misunderstanding. I think. Yeah, I think that's more likely to be the former than the latter. Um, I can tell you, uh, when we did this in the VRG, <laughs> that I had, I was fascinated with this book and with the discussion in the VRG, and it led me to, there was a couple of people who were going to discuss critique of pure reason <laughs> right after, and I was in that group for about three weeks, and my background's chemistry, not philosophy. Ooh. What's the I, VRG? I, it's a virtual reading group. Virtual oh, reading oh, okay, right, right, yeah, right. Um, okay, no, I've seen it but, on Twitter. Yeah. Right, and I, <laughs> I yeah. hit an understanding wall. Like, this I could follow. Kant, well, yeah, I, I was... This is a lot easier than Kant. So, if that's the question... Yeah, in principle, it's I think accessible. it's all accessible. I don't see yeah. why anyone would kind of stumble into flat misunderstandings. Again, there's always going to be difference of interpretation. We've been pursuing that in our workshop. So, if everyone agreed, you would, there'd be no purpose to the workshop. The idea is for people to flat, thrash out, you know, yeah. different views. And we're, we're trying to do that. And mm -hmm. it's fruitful because you see what other people... I mean, this is the whole theme of the... The, the, the judgment thing is that it's in dialogue with other people that you come to see other perspectives and enlarge your own perspective. That's that's the fundamental, you know, core of what Aaron understands by judging, and we're practicing it all the time, and we're certainly practicing it, you know, even in discussing the camp lectures. So. That seems like a good David. Oh, I'm just going to say, this, this is a brief thing. It's just an observation I had when I started working on Arendt, and uh, would read uh, some of the responses of political scientists of the mm -hmm. time to her work, yeah. who just seemed to think what she was talking about was not politics. <laughs> and, though I'm on her side and not theirs. And yeah. was, was, I forget where it is now. There's the proceedings of a conference, yeah. and they published the question and answer afterwards. And, and Arnett responded to someone who said, you know, my job uh, teaching at universities of political scientists is to, you know, Tell my students, you know, the, the right politics to follow, <laughs> and our kind of explodes and says, "My God, these people are adults; they can make up their own mind." You know, we're not here to indoctrinate them in certain kinds of progressive ideas and so forth. Yeah, no, um, I know what I know the text you're referring yeah, to. So it's the thing called Hannah Arendt on Hannah Arendt, Melvin oh, right, Hill, right, right. who was a student of hers, 
published this collection mm -hmm. that came out of a conference that was held actually in my city, in Toronto, at York University. It got published as a book with, at the end, this trans transcripts of her exchanges, including, I think the, the, tra the, the exchange you're referring to was with a colleague of mine mm -hmm. at the University of Toronto, namely Christian Bay, mm -hmm. and, you know, his idea of what political theory was and her idea were ra radically opposed. Yeah. And I, that, made, that transcript, which actually I got before it was published from Mary McCarthy, she, when I met her in that, her flat in Paris, she, you know, handed a copy to me because she had been sent it and said, oh, well, just take it back to Oxford Xerox it and mail me back the original, which I did. And it had a huge impact on me. Yeah. And that exchange in particular, and I was totally on Aaron's side. Yeah, me too. And, and I had that sort of debate with Christian because I knew him. He, he died pretty young, but I did. It, 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 I did overlap with him a bit as soon after I arrived in Toronto, and I had kind of a parallel exchange with him. And he had very strong views that the purpose of theory was to shape the practice of your students. That you, you know, what would be the point of theory? Theory for the sake of theory made no sense to him. Like we, it's all about practice. That theory and praxis should be, you know, it's the purpose of theory is to shape and reshape praxis and make people better citizens, pursuing better policies and improving the world, making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, why are you doing theory? Well, you know, I think it was pretty obvious to Aaron that, you know, theory, theory doesn't have to be justified instrumentally, that, that part of what makes us human is thinking, you know, and, and, and theory for its own sake, it makes perfect sense, you know. And uh, I was... Uh, that, that, so that, that text, I encourage everyone who hasn't read it to, to read it. Look for the, the, the volumes, Melvin Hill, Hannah Arendt, The Recovery of the Public World. It's uh, published by St. Martin's Press because Hill, who put the book together, was then, I think, an editor for St. Martin's Press, so they published it. And it's at the end of the book, and it's a tremendous, not just her and Christian yeah. Bay, but all the interlocutors and other colleagues of mine were also there. So Chris, uh, you know, C.B. McPherson was participating, and he too had some sharp challenges to put to her, and she had pretty sharp challenges mm -hmm. back to him. And it's fascinating, fascinating exchanges on, on all sides. And Mary McCarthy was there, so she was in Toronto for that. And uh, so was Hans Jonas, and just power, really powerful, powerful challenges and powerful replies from Aaron. And, you kind of really see the power of Aaron as a thinker mm -hmm. in those exchanges. So I strongly, strongly urge people to to track that down if they haven't read it and, and read it. Great. So before we uh, conclude, just a few quick things. Um, uh, first, to thank those of you for uh, for, for coming. Um, the uh, Journal of the Art Center, Volume 11, uh, just came out. Um, if you're not a member of the center and are interested, um, uh, journal is one of the many perks that come with membership, um, so feel free to inquire about that. Um, and look for uh, more news about uh, our fall conference, which is happening in October, and the theme this year is friendship and politics, um, which should be very exciting. Um, so if you're interested in journal, uh, joining the center as a member, um, come talk to myself or Roger Berkowitz, the director of the center. Um, and also, if you haven't subscribed already to as I, though I suspect many of you have um, our weekly free newsletter, Amor Mundi. Uh, you can do that as well and stay uh, apprised of all the various uh, activities and events and things that are going on uh, here in the center. Um, there's, I think, some coffee and dessert and stuff in the back as well on your way out. Feel free to help yourselves. Uh, and with that, just uh, join me again in thanking Robert. <laughs>